wanted to give you a little bit of background information about the Department of Energy National Laboratories. Now, some of you already work at some of the laboratories, uh, Argonne, Los Alamos, and Livermore, and so on, Berkeley, I think. But um, in any case, I'll give you a little bit more information, because many people are, are not aware that you know, the Department of Energy has many, actually 17, uh, national laboratories. Now, Argonne happens to be the first to have the title National Laboratory. Um, now, to be honest, Los Alamos uh, was founded a little bit before Argonne, but it, it was initially called Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. So they don't qualify for being the first national lab. Uh, sorry about uh, you guys from Los Alamos. I know there are a couple of you here. But in, in this map, you can see that there are labs all over the place. Uh, perhaps the best known ones are Oak Ridge, Argonne, Berkeley, Los Alamos, Livermore, Sandia. Uh, but there are many others like Knowles and Bettis and Savannah River that you may not know. In any case, it's, it's a big complex and uh, does a lot of interesting research and has for many years. So Argonne itself is the result of the effort at the University of Chicago by Enrico Fermi and many colleagues to do the first controlled nuclear fission reaction. And so CP1, which is Chicago Pile 1, uh, was put together under the stands of what used to be a football stadium at the University of Chicago in, in Hyde Park, south part of Chicago. And uh, this is a drawing of that first pile. Uh, so all the little bricks that you see are made of graphite. And uh, I'm the proud owner of one little piece of it encased in uh, plastic from that pile. So that's um, how Argon got started. Uh, right after the war in um, 1946, uh, it was decided that maybe it wasn't the best location right in the city to do nuclear uh, research. And so um, the government bought a big plot of land, initially 3,000 acres, uh, uh, about 25 miles southwest of the city. So Argonne's mission has gone far beyond the initial. Uh, the initial one was nuclear energy. So not weapons, but using nuclear fission to produce electricity. Um, that's, it still does a lot of work in that, but now it's broadened uh, a lot of work on the environment, uh, energy science, so you know, batteries, for example, uh, the um, Chevy Volt, which is an electric vehicle, uses batteries that are that were designed at Argonne and, and uh, manufactured under license from Argonne, for example. And then there are major user facilities. Um, so the, the biggest uh, are the advanced photon source. That those of you who will go on the tour will get to see, which uh, <clears throat> produces extremely light, uh, bright x-rays and, and is used for many different kinds of research, from biology, pharmaceuticals, and, and uh, material science, for example. The uh, <clears throat> Argon Tandem Linear Accelerator and uh, the Physics Department is another a center for nanoscale materials, uh, Electron Microspity Center. And, and one indication of how far along computing, uh, modeling, and simulation has come is that the uh, Argon Leadership Computing Facility is also an international facility. Um, so just like uh, particle accelerators. Uh, the, the advanced photon source, as I'm sure you'll be told, has over 5,000 users a year. Uh, we don't have that many for the uh, computing facility by design because our computing facility was uh, established to aim at the very top end of scientific computing. And so we actually don't want thousands of users because if we had thousands of them, then any one user wouldn't be able to get very much of a big system. Now, Argonne's been involved in computing from the very beginning, almost. So in the very early 1950s, John von Neumann designed a, a computer that was going to be built, and it was eventually built at Princeton uh, Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, when uh, people at Argonne learned about it, uh, they uh, asked if they could have the plans, and um, so they got the plans, and 
then as they were starting to build it, they thought of better ways to build certain aspects of it. And from that came Avidac, which is Argonne's version of the Institute's digital arithmetic computer. And so that was built over four years. And um, as I recall, I was actually working before the, the one at Princeton was working. Now, before that, there was a lot of computing being done at Argonne, but it was done with uh, electronic calculators, electric calculators, I should say. And so even then, people did parallel computing. So you'd have rooms, maybe almost the size of this one, uh, but without air conditioning. Um, and uh, everyone, you know, any, uh, each of you would have a Monroe or Monchant calculator. And people were given different parts of the calculation to do. And then they would pass the printed output with their intermediate results in a pattern to others. And, and so those people's job titles were computer. So people were computers. And, and so uh, that, that's how parallel computing used to be done. Uh, but you know, with Avidac, you, know, you could go 100,000 times as fast as a trained computer, as it says on the slide, using a desk calculator. And then Oak Ridge National Lab, of course, heard about this and said, gee, we want one like that too. And, and so um, Argonne helped design the Oracle, and, um, uh, which was initially built at Argonne and then moved uh, down to Oak Ridge. And uh, one, you know, one of the people who helped design it was Margaret Butler, who had also helped design parts of Avidac. And uh, you know, Margaret Butler was a very distinguished scientist and physicist and very early computer scientist, although we didn't call him that at the time. And so Argonne actually has a named fellowship, the Margaret Butler Fellowship for Postdoctoral Studies uh, that's given out every two years, if you know if you have any colleagues who might be interested in that, uh, please let them know about it. So to give you a feel for what most of the Argonne campus looks like now, now there's an aerial shot. You can see towards the top the Argonne, uh, the advanced photon source, rather. Um, and um, towards the um, bottom here is the, um, well, this is where you come into the, build, the uh, um, campus, and this is the building uh, where Mira and many other computers are housed. And then over here, partially uh, shielded by trees, is Building 208, where the nuclear energy exhibit is. Um, the reason I decided to start this uh, training program, I guess it's been uh, four years now that we, this is the fourth instance of the program, and so I started thinking about it roughly five and a half years ago, I guess. and. And that's because you know today's computers are getting very complex. You know they're more and more useful, and people are able to do things they couldn't do before. But uh, it's really difficult to program them, and we need a lot of applications to be developed, and that means we need a lot of people with the right expertise. And so this course, although it's compressed in only two weeks, I originally dreamed of a six-week course to cover everything in the depth that would be nice, but you know, we'll make do with two weeks, and by the end of the two weeks, you'll probably feel that it has been six weeks because it's pretty intense. Um, so um, that's why uh, we decided to establish this training program. You know, fortunately, uh, I put in a, a proposal to the Department of Energy, and they said, that seems like a good idea, and they have been funding it. That's a good thing. The OE Leadership Computing Facility happens to have two centers, one at Oak Ridge and one at Argonne. And it was actually established by an act of Congress in the year 2004. Uh, that was um, at a time when Japan had um, put in place a new computer uh, known as the Earth Simulator that was um, more powerful than any computer we had in the United States. And so Congress got a bit excited about that. and and passed an act which said uh, the US needs big machines for uh, doing the kinds of simulations uh, that are helpful in many different fields. And so we will have our own leadership computing facility. And it will be at two places. Uh, and that's uh, in, for a lot of reasons. But one of them is because we want to be able to have at least two different kinds of supercomputers at any one time that creates more competition among the companies that make them, 
And also, some of the architectures are a little bit better for certain kinds of calculations than others, and, and so there can be a sweet spot for one versus the other. And, as I already hinted at, these two centers try to give out relatively few projects, but each one might have a lot of time allocated. So these days, some of the projects get 300 million core hours per year for a single project on one of these systems. So that's a lot of computing. But it's needed when you're trying to do very challenging problems. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a snapshot, you know, Mira, the one that Argon has 49,000 nodes. Uh, each node has 16 cores, and so the whole system has three quarters of a million cores, and each one has a gigabyte of memory, so you have three quarters of a petabyte of main memory. Uh, the Oak Ridge, so, and this is a homogeneous system. Uh, the Oak Ridge system is uh, based on Cray, and it's a heterogeneous system, so it has CPUs from AMD uh, with 16 cores, but it gets most of its power, about 90% of it, from NVIDIA GPUs, uh, 16, well, 18,688 of them. So about 300,000 cores, uh, but over 18,000 GPUs, and you can see the memory. So the peak on these systems are 10 and, and 27 petaflops, uh, respectively. A little bit more detail on the Argon systems. You know, in general, our facilities like this one have one big system, but then a lot of ancillary systems. Uh, some are, like, as you can see, Vesta and Cetus, they're the same architecture as the big system, but they're smaller versions of it, and so they can be used for testing, for quick turnaround of smaller jobs, for trying out new versions of an operating system. And then um, a lot of the time, to, do, to understand what was done in the calculation, you need to be able to visualize it or analyze the data. And, and so there's, a, at Argonne, a play, uh, system called Cooley, um, which is dedicated to visualization and data analysis. Now, how many of you can guess as to why that system would be called Cooley? Anybody familiar with that name? So there's an algorithm known as the Fast Fourier Transform. You're familiar with that one, I presume, many of you. Well, the paper that was that described that algorithm in 1965 was written by two people whose names were Tukey, T-U-K-E-Y, and Cooley. So the predecessor to this system we actually called Tukey, but the newer one is Cooley. So now you have something for your uh, Jeopardy uh, uh, training. And, and then, of course, you have to store data. So storage, you can see we have um, you know, over 28 petabytes of uh, disk. And um, of course, also um, uh, tape storage as well. But that's today's story. Um, in addition to the leadership facility, uh, Department of Energy Office of Science also operates a big facility at Berkeley in the National Energy Research Supercomputing Center, NERSC. And I won't go through this slide in any detail. You can read it. Uh, but the story here is simply that um, the uh, Oak Ridge and Argonne Leadership Computing Facilities will very soon be upgrading from Mira and Titan to new systems. Now, at Argonne, it's a two-phased upgrade. Theta, which is actually uh, physically installed now, uh, will be available any week now. And then Aurora, a couple of years from now, uh, will be 180 petaflops. Um, and whereas Oak Ridge will get a system of um, 150 to 200 petaflops peak uh, that they have called Summit. And it will continue to be based on uh, mostly GPUs. But in this case, it will be IBM CPUs instead of uh, AMD. So I'll, I'll let you read these numbers at your leisure. The point is, every few years, typically every four to five years, the leadership facilities upgrade to much bigger systems. So um, this training program will have access to Mira, Cetus, Vesta, and Cooley that I've mentioned. Uh, so you'll have accounts on all of those. And um, there are reservations for certain time periods so that you have big chunks of Mira for um, uh, doing some of the work that uh, you've been learning about. 
Uh, but you'll also have access to Titan at Oak Ridge and to Edison and Corey, the systems at uh, NERSC. So different architectures, which is part of the, of the issue that you know, because in the world there are these different architectures, we wanted you to have access to many of them at the very high end so you don't get stuck with blinders on. You say, well, this works very well on this architecture, but you may have to rethink the algorithm and its implementation when you, do, when you use another system. And you can't tell today what system you will be running your application on three, four, or five years from now because they'll be cycling in and out different systems. So at Argonne, we're looking forward to Aurora a couple of years from now. It will continue to be homogeneous architecture, many core, um, and uh, you know, much faster than, than Mira. Uh, and you can see that there's some advances in the base technology in that it'll be 18 times faster, but it'll only use 2.7 times as much electricity. Electricity usage is a big deal nowadays because these systems consume quite a bit. So Aurora will consume about 13 megawatts. Well, rule of thumb is that a megawatt per year costs a million dollars. So just keeping the thing running with electricity, um, you know, it's a fair amount of money. And um, that's one of the things that Exascale is trying to uh, improve even further, as I'll say later. Now, one thing about Aurora is that it's the Intel architecture, so it's what most computers run in the world. It's the x86 architecture, so that's an advantage. So Theta, you know, there's a photo of Theta. Um, and um, so it's, it's already put together. Some tests have been run on it uh, last week. Um, so there again, you can see that it's uh, about the same speed as Mira, not quite, uh, but it uses far less electricity than Mira and has many fewer um, nodes you know, only about 2,500 instead of 49,000, right? So time marches on. Okay, so a little bit more on the course uh, that you're about to take. Uh, we've organized it in what somehow we started calling curriculum tracks. And so we thought we'd start with hardware architectures because, you know, after all, that's basic information you have to know and understand so that you can productively use these systems. You know, unfortunately, there are no magic compilers that you, know, you can just say something very high level like a partial differential equation and it gets translated efficiently into code on a given system. So Pete Beckman, uh, who's from Argon, is leading that, but there are a number of speakers in that track. Um, then for several days, programming models and languages, because after all, that's how you access the systems. And so we'll spend a lot of time on the most commonly used programming models, uh, but also uh, expose you to some new programming models and languages which are up and coming uh, for your education, and also because you may find in a small number of years that those have gotten enough traction that they're available on the systems, and maybe for the work you're doing, that's what we'll, you'll want to be doing, using PGAS languages, for example, instead of just message passing uh, models. Numerical algorithms and, and libraries are very important. There's a, an institute called Fast Math, that's what that word means, um, led by uh, Lori Diachin. And uh, so Lori and Lois McInnes and Mark Miller will, are leading that track. So you'll have a day and a half of that, Friday and half of Saturday. Um, and then Ray Loy, whom we've already met, uh, and Scott Parker uh, will be uh, leading the track on toolkits and frameworks. So tools like uh, performance analyzers, debuggers, uh, and frameworks that make it easier to create your program, visualization and data analysis. And of course, data uh, is very important. Doing I.O. on these parallel machines is often a bottleneck, but there are ways around it. And and the tools for that, so you'll be exposed to that. One thing that we started from the very first time we offered this training program was to have talks during dinner. Uh, the idea was to uh, cover some things that are not part of those tracks that I just mentioned, but relevant and interesting, hopefully. Um, and so, uh, you know, this year, the, this is the uh, 
a gang of nine uh, that will be giving the dinner talks. Now, this um, program has been funded by the Department of Energy, Office of Science, and within the Office of Science, the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research. Um, and um, as of this year, uh, it's actually part of the Exascale Computing Project, uh, for which I am the director. It, it really fits in well with that project, as I'll show you during dinner. So those are the people that we need to thank for uh, funding the program. And um, in addition, uh, one of the speakers tomorrow, James Reinders, until very recently from Intel, he just retired, uh, but also Intel gave all of you uh, a copy of uh, this very nice book, a very uh, recently published book on programming the Knight's Landing systems. Now, when you start writing papers that are um, based on work that you've done at the various facilities, the computing facilities, um, here is the wording of the acknowledgments you should use. So I'm sure after this training program, you'll be very productive and you'll start being able to publish papers on computational science. Um, so uh, those would be the right uh, acknowledgments to use depending on where you uh, did the runs.